Now, tens of thousands of Channel migrants will be given a one-way ticket to Rwanda under plans unveiled yesterday by the government. Anyone entering the UK illegally since January the 1st could be relocated to Rwanda, while they'll be considered for asylum and resettlement. Migrants will have the opportunity to build a new life in Rwanda, says Boris Johnson, supported by an initial £120 million of UK government funding as part of a migration and economic development partnership with the landlocked East African state. And when he spoke yesterday, I have to say the Prime Minister sounded pretty determined. Economic migrants taking advantage of the asylum system will not get to stay in the UK, while those in genuine need uh, will be properly protected, including with access to legal services on arrival in Rwanda. And given the opportunity to build a new life in that dynamic country, supported by the funding we are providing. This Rwanda plan was the centrepiece of a package unveiled by Johnson and Home Secretary Priti Patel to combat record numbers of migrants crossing the Channel, already over 5,000 this year alone, more than double the rate of 2021. On Wednesday, 600 migrants reached the UK the highest number in a single day so far this year. Ministers argue that what they call vile people smugglers are turning the channel into a watery graveyard, with migrants, quote, drowning in unseaworthy boats and suffocating in refrigerated lorries. Labour calls the government's plans unworkable and cruel. But ministers believe that by reducing the attraction of Britain, the numbers making the perilous journey across the channel will fall, plus... The growing backlog of claims means the asylum system now absorbs almost £2 billion of public money a year. Hotels for asylum seekers are costing £4.7 million each and every day. Yes, it will cost between 20000 and 30000 ministers estimate, for each migrant sent to Rwanda, but they say that's cheaper in the long run. So what are these measures in terms of economics, humanity, compassion... And that's our second on-the-money question today. Do the government's Rwanda proposals make sense? Join me now in the studio for what will clearly be a contentious debate, but a necessary debate. We have the former UKIP leader and border force expert, Henry Bolton. We have the deputy editor at Conservative Home, Henry Hill. We have Refugee and Asylum Rights Director at Amnesty International UK, Steve Valdez-Simmons. Plus, with me in the studio, Vicky Price is still with us. She used to run the government's economic service. Vicky was a senior civil servant. A fabulous cast. Let me start with you, Steve Valdez-Simmons. You're more than welcome on my show. You are the Director for Asylum Rights at Amnesty International UK. Give us your thoughts on these government plans unveiled yesterday. Well, I, I read the Memorandum of Understanding. That's the agreement that's been reached um, yesterday. It's very vague about anything except the one thing it's very clear about is that nothing in this agreement is intended to allow anyone, whether the people who are shipped to Rwanda under it, or indeed the governments themselves, to use it to hold either the UK or the Rwandan government to account. So I think it speaks volumes of what this is about. It is about the UK washing its hands of responsibility for the people involved. As for the money, which I know is of interest to, to you and your, your particular show, um, it says absolutely nothing. It says financial arrangements will be made. It says nothing as to how much this is to cost and how much the UK will ultimately have to pay, or indeed for how many people, at what rate, or anything else. Steve, let me say I agree with you. The financials surrounding this plan are extremely vague. I've had a rummage around trying to get across them before hosting this debate, and I've so far been pretty stymied as well. Let's go, it comes to the studio now. Let's come to you uh, Henry Bolton, you'll be known as the former leader of 
you, Kip. Yes. But you are. Quite shed that, by the way. <laughs> you also are a border force expert in your own right. What did yeah. you make of these plans? Is there anything in what Steve says? They seem completely uncosted. At I'm, this I'm point. going to agree with Steve. Now that sounds maybe strange, given part of my background. Um, I've, I've helped 14 different countries to write national integrated border management strategies. The UK still doesn't have one. And you know, Alp Mehmet, who you showed earlier from Migration Watch, he said, well, you know, this this is one element of what should be a broader plan. And I agree. It, it may act as some sort of deterrent. But as Steve has quite li- rightly just said, and you, you've, you've also noted, the finances are not worked out. £120 million, million pounds initial package to Rwanda. Well, that sounds like a little bit of a, you know, um, you know some, it's a bit of a, a bribe to them, effectively. It says that other, there will be, the UK will also provide financial support to integration, accommodation and so on. But none of this is, is specified, probably because it's almost impossible to say how much this is actually going to cost us in the long run. So you, what we lack in this country is a cohesive, coordinated national cross-governmental strategy to deal with all aspects of our borders, not just immigration and asylum. But I came up on the, on the train following the M20 today. Nose-to-tail trucks on the M20. That's a border issue. That's you on know, the way to Kent. That's on the way to, down to Dover in Kent, yeah. So that's a border issue. The narcotics and so on that are coming across in, on the ferries and in some of these small boats, also, that is a border issue. Fisheries, that is a border issue. And yet we've got all of these different agencies working on these borders in, in, in their own way. There's no unifying framework. We're, not, we're doing very little internationally to disrupt these organised crime groups. Until 2006, the UK had a very effective programme to actually go out there proactively with intelligence and tactical operations to disrupt transnational organised crime groups involved in people smuggling and human trafficking. The finance of that was pulled in 2006, but it was highly effective. And what I'm saying here, you've got a number of measures, all of which need to be put together in a coordinated, cohesive way to address the phenomenon, phenom, phenomenon of people smuggling and migration to the UK and, in fact, the broader European continent. And we haven't got it at the moment. OK, let's turn to our second Henry in this discussion, Henry Hill. You're from Conservative Home, Henry, a very influential website where Conservative activists, supporters post articles and so on. You have huge readership. You have polls of which cabinet members are most popular among Tory grassroots activists, the same activists who can decide pretty much who is the Conservative leader. How are these proposals going down among your readers, Henry? Well, I imagine that in principle they will be going down pretty well. But I think the, one of the major problems the government faces about this is the corrosive scepticism about the Home Office's capacity to get anything done. Because for years now, the, the government has been trapped, trapped in this cycle of talking really tough about channel boats and then not getting anything done, making no difference. The boats keep coming. And that just means that they, they sort of get the worst of both worlds because they increase the salience of the issue and they attract attention. So the problem, this visible sign of lack of control, which is what voters tend to hate most about the immigration discussion rather than anything particularly about numbers, whilst not doing anything about it. I just want to add something quickly about one of the purposes of these proposals that I've heard from Home Office sources, which is that it's actually about one of the biggest problems the Home Office has is that people smugglers encourage people crossing the channel to destroy their papers when they do. And that means that if they reach the UK, as and when we've considered their claim, it is incredibly difficult to return people whose claims fail to their countries of origin if they've destroyed their papers. Now, the threat of having your claim processed in Rwanda is that obviously if you if your claim fails you, and you get rejected, you're, you're, you're sort of in Rwanda and you might need your papers to get back to somewhere that you'd rather be. So I think the hope is that even if they don't necessarily start sending everyone to Rwanda straight away or even at all, the risk that you will be sent there will encourage people to hold on to their papers, which will make them easier to process even if they do end up being processed in the United Kingdom. We're going to carry this important discussion on over the break. Before we do, Vicky, let's just come briefly to you. I know you feel you're originally from a Greek background, as I'm originally from an Irish background. We're both from immigrant backgrounds. How do you feel about these proposals? Well, the the reaction that uh, most people I know have had is that they, they are probably not going to work. So, yes, of course, we've all been terribly grateful, you and I, Mm. um, for being in this country and lots of other people probably watching this. 
Um, we had to go through various, you know, procedures to get mm. here and so on and get accepted. That was, of course, for me before Greece joined the EU. So indeed, yeah. Um, but the the issue that we've just been discussing is, you know, you mentioned the civil service. It's very unfair to just say the Home Office has sort of no strategy and is failing all the time. The interesting thing is that the Home Office has been considered to be a failing or a... a, a not fit, a, a not for, fit purpose. for purpose. Remember, but John so Reid, late Tony Blair's Home, of, home, mm-hmm. home Secretary. Indeed, by so many mm. different mm. Uh, Home Secretaries that you begin to wonder, and I was certainly wondering that when I was, and I knew the very, very good people who were in the Home mm. Office, mm. whether the real problem is that policies change all the time uh, depending on, because this is, you know, uh, if, if you want to be tough on law and order and all that sort of stuff, um, you may need to push the, or the, the the whole thing up a little bit at various times when elections are coming up. So mm. now, for example, the May elections, uh, and then you change the strategy that the civil servants have to work on, uh, or you take some of the funding away because the Treasury has decided... You know, so with all like, the political chopping and so, changing, yeah. it makes it very difficult to implement a policy, right? Well, you, ch- you change all the time and therefore it looks, indeed, as Henry was saying, that you don't actually, you're not able to implement. A, have one which is consistent across and B, implement it. And, and that's a big, big issue because a lot of these things require a lot of money. Now, remember, the change that's happened now, just recently, what we were hearing from Priti Patel, certainly, was that we were going to turn the boats back. Mm. And we were going to intervene to do that, which, of course, has now been considered not to be the right thing to do. Uh, so now we've changed it to sending them somewhere else. A little while ago, we heard they were going to all go to Albania. Mm. So, so we've got to bear in mind that, that there are, for, for political reasons, all sorts of pronouncements made, which the poor civil servants, if I may defend the civil servants, Henry may decide against that, <laughs> no, no, uh, can't really cope with. Henry's itching to come I, in, Henry I, Bob. I am, but, I'm going to just... Park you there, though, if I may, because we are going to come to a break, but we'll come back to you after. It's a fabulous discussion. It's being conducted in a good-natured way. I'm proud of that. So I'm glad you're all here to have this chat. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we will keep this discussion going with my expert panel. 